Go ahead and start making your way towards your seat. Hey, bro. Awesome. Great to be with you all. My name is Luke, and uh, I have the honor and privilege of pastoring our young people, our youth students. We got some up, up here, a couple around. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I got dressed this morning, my son told me, my three-year-old son said, Dad, it's not a wedding day, which uh, was an indication to me that, like, he knows when I wear one of my two button-ups that we're usually going to a wedding. And so, and I wear Star Wars shirts to church. So, anyways, there was some debate about my jean jacket if it was still in. My wife is saying no. She said it's too gen, too, gen, uh, too much millennial. And I was like, I am a millennial. So, uh, me and Julie were like, are they in or out? Anyways, I'll have to ask you guys in a little bit. But uh, we are in week two of Nehemiah, and I'm, I'm really excited to get to teach through the first few verses of chapter two. But I want to begin with a story. Uh, this story begins in 1791. The House of Commons buzzed with debate as politicians argued, weighed decisions, and ultimately tried to maintain the status quo. The issue at hand was the abolition of the British slave trade, an issue as old as time, uh, as entrenched as the roots of the empire itself. There in the commons, one man stood up. Stillness filled the air as if everyone were holding their breath. He knew that the opposition was fierce. He knew the wealthy elite, the powerful traders, even his own colleagues were against him. He knew that he may face a personal cost, threats against his career, uh, his reputation, his friendships, but he also knew something greater. That was the suffering of millions whose voices had been silenced for centuries. As he began to speak, his words were clear, unapologetic, he described the brutalities of the slave trade, the human lives that were destroyed, the families that were tore apart. With his eyes fixed firmly on those that were before him, he said, having heard all of this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. Fear had gripped him a moment before this, but prayer had given him the courage to step up. His boldness in that speech was unmistakable. History would look back and see that this man's bold step in faith, facing down the powers that be, was the catalyst for change. He would fight for years, enduring personal sacrifice, but the seeds he had planted grew into one of the most pivotal moments of justice in British history, the abolition of the slave trade in 1807. One man spoke truth, and the walls of injustice began to crumble. This man was William Wilberforce, and because he refused to look the other way, Britain would no longer be the same. So I want to start this morning with posing some questions to you. I hope that these questions will linger in your heart long after we leave this place. Here's the first one. What truths are you aware of that demand your attention? What needs in your life, your community, or our nation cry out for a response while it feels easier to look the other way? What courageous steps might God be asking you to take in the face of daunting challenges? Let's explore this together through the story of Nehemiah, a man who heard of the destruction, the ruins of his homeland, and chose to respond with bold faith and action. He had a choice to remain silent or to step into the mess, to pray and act despite many risks involved. Here it is, Nehemiah 2.1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. The Hebrew translation would be more like, I had never been sad in his presence before. It's important to note the difference between the power difference between the kings and those that were serving him. 
the cupbearer would have held a very important position. He, he did have direct access to the king, he wore a signet ring, and he was probably the chief financial officer, but he was still very much inferior. Although, like Dave mentioned last week, he did get to drink amazing wine for a living. Uh, let's not forget, his job was also to die. So a good day in the office would be to die on behalf of the king. I guess his job was either like a one or a ten. Okay, so uh, this king was not a fun guy to work for. Uh, he w actually, he killed his brother to get this job. He put down two insurrections and he ruled with an iron fist for 40 years. Think more like a mob boss. I found uh, some reliefs, some Persian reliefs that portray the king's court, and there, those that are in his presence would have covered their mouths so as not to offend the king by accidentally breathing on him. Uh, the king probably wouldn't have seen Nehemiah's face much, but when he did, there was an expectation of great joy to be in the king's presence. So, Nehemiah had not yet been sat in front of the king out of fear. I believe that for Nehemiah, speaking to the king about this was worth his life. Verses 2 through, th two through 3 say, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city... The place of my father's graves lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So the king says, why are you sad? And I believe that Nehemiah had been waiting to have this conversation with the king. But there may have been a moment when the king asked, why are you sad, that he may have been tempted to say, I'm not sad. Everything's fine. We're good. But this was the day that Nehemiah couldn't keep it in any longer he actually talks to the king, and we get a little glimpse into Nehemiah's internal dialogue. It says that he was very much afraid. He was terrified. Why? Because his request was actually crazy. Thirteen years prior, the exact same request was made of the exact same king, and the answer was no. Nehemiah is asking the king to overturn governmental foreign policy and also his very own decree. I love something that Dave said in our prayer meeting this week uh, and staff. It's that if you look at chapter 1, uh, there, there's something really awesome about Nehemiah's perspective as it pertains to this king. 111 says this, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. This is the most powerful man alive at the time. He was reigning over an absolutely dominant superpower, largest empire that the world had ever seen. And who was he to Nehemiah? Just a man. Just this man. So was he afraid? Yes, but he knew that no one was bigger than his God. He goes on to say, my home has been destroyed. And the king says, what are you requesting? In verses 4 through 8. So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let the letters be given to the governors of the pr province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me t timber to make beams for the gates of my fortress, uh, of the fortress of the temple. And for the wall of the city and the house that I shall occupy. The king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. So the king says, what are you asking? And it says, again, his internal dialogue, I prayed to the God of heaven. He asked the king to allow him to go and to rebuild the walls. But what, what's really stood out to me this week is, is how, uh, how bold he is. He asks for political power. He asks for letters, and, and we'll see that it includes a military escort. He asks for all the supplies 
to accomplish the job uh, from the king's favorite forest. And he also says, like, hey, let's go ahead and just throw my house in while we're at it. Would you pl- I also need a place to be. Uh, not to mention all of this time off, right? He asks, like, how long will you be gone? And I'm assuming he's like, 52 days or more. And the king's like, okay, Nehemiah, let's go. This is crazy. I'm, I'm impressed with his boldness, but so was the king. The king agrees, and we see Nehemiah's internal voice once again. The good hand of my God was upon me, because the king gave me all of that that I asked for. There's uh, 2, verses 9 through 10. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, and I gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen, and when Sanballat and, and the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. In Nehemiah's story, we witness a profound journey that begins with fear, moves through prayer, and leads to courageous action in the face of overwhelming opposition. Nehemiah's interest was not only to himself or, or for his immediate family, his vision included God's people. What's been interesting is this, uh, just before we gathered this morning, Austin was saying that he was feeling like pe- people have been s- sharing this word of release, and he's been talking to me about how God has been speaking about uh, giving up comfort in his life for the, for the, for, uh, in exchange for God's comfort. And someone else said, hey, I feel like God's been saying that to me too. And I just, first service was reflecting, going, Uh, why is God preparing us all to take comfort in God? I feel like as Austin was sharing that, I was thinking, well, you better buckle up for today's message because a lot of it is about giving up comfort. And so crazy that God is moving us all in this sort of way. Um, But I believe that as we look at Nehemiah's life, uh, I, 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 for one, have been convicted at my own hardness of heart, my lack of empathy and concern, um, my own desire for comfort. And I love what we see in Mervyn Brenneman. He has this quote. He says, more concern about God's honor and more time in communion with God in prayer will result in more intense concern about prayer needs. That is, we, uh, I believe that Nehemiah had been praying in communion with God, and as he was in communion with God, his concern became less about himself and more with those around him. And so, Uh, This morning, I actually want to apply this story uh, to three categories of our lives, and I think we can do that in four movements today. I've got um, this here. As we look at Nehemiah's story, there's four movements, and I think there's three categories that we can apply this. Dave kind of hit on this last week, but uh, restoration uh, in our life, uh, in in our personal lives, in in our culture, in our church. Um, But I, I believe... Uh, that there are things in all of these areas, things in our own life, our community, within our nation, within our church, Cedar Mill, and within the church. I believe there are some things that lie in waste, have been destroyed, are devastated and desolate. Maybe uh, in your own life, it's a relationship that needs rebuilding a family member, or a friend, or maybe in your life there's been betrayal, or maybe you're stuck in shame and guilt, or trapped in habits, or stuck in grief. Perhaps you're facing disillusionment with the church. Within our culture, uh, even just here in Portland, one of the biggest ones that stands out is the, the houses, houselessness uh, problem. There, there's great division and polarization in our nation. Our culture has an earnest desire for justice, but lacks foundation and understanding. They don't, they don't fully grasp the Imago Dei, and so they often miss God's heart for women, for ethnic minorities, for elderly, for the unborn, for those with disabilities. And in our, in our church, um, in, in the church, often the church will, will fail to, to meet the needs of the poor. Uh, that One of the great critiques of the church is our lack of unity. Or a, a phrase that I heard when I first got here, too much navel-gazing. Right? That's looking at your belly button. It's being internally focused. Too much navel-gazing. Much 
work to be done in the church as it comes to uh, repairing our witness to the LGBTQ plus community. You may have noticed or felt desolation in these areas, but I am encouraged that Nehemiah did not simply lament destruction. He took decisive action. And that's the first point I want to talk about today is the call to action. Notice that Nehemiah's approach was not to pray and to do nothing. Note, too, that he, when the king asked, he had a complete plan in mind. That struck me this week. The king asked, and Nehemiah was like, "Why? Well, I'm glad you asked. Boom, boom, boom. Started listing things out. Jay White notes, prayer is where planning starts. But it's actually both prayer and planning that we're able to carry out the will of God. Research is not a lack of faith. I think of my move here to Portland. I remember my friend Nick called me up, said, hey, you should join me over here at Cedar Mill Bible Church. And now he's left me in the dust. What's with that? <laughs> but uh, he called me out. He said, you should consider coming out here. And I came, but it wasn't before fervently seeking the Lord. Me and Danica, many of you know this if you've made a big transition seasons of transition are are major times of prayer we spent a lot of time praying we met with mentors we asked about um pay we looked at the cost of living i flew over here and met pastors and interviewed and then i chose to act in dependence and build a life and a ministry over here nehemiah prayed he planned and he acted in dependence we see that um, the month of Nisan, this is around April, um, and it would be the beginning of the Persian and the Jewish year, and it reveals just how long Nehemiah had persisted in fasting and in prayer. Uh, it was four months since the news had reached him. Now his praying had reached a point where it was time for action. He'd been chewing on it for a while. I wonder, for those in the room, what is God calling you to what plans or dreams has God placed on your heart? What plans or dreams might he be placing on your heart right now? Maybe for some of you, he's, he's called you to do something and you have forgotten. Oftentimes, God does this. He'll plant something in our hearts and our minds, and then it will just sort of grow through prayer. Uh, it'll grow, and then eventually God will say, it's time, Go. But so often, in, in my own life, when God says go, fear grips me. Comfort calls me. And so I want to talk about this fear. Often in my life, I am like the one that James talks about in James chapter 2. The one that, that sees a need and says, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, um, but does nothing about their physical needs. I want desperately to rebuild my own life. I want to rebuild our community, our nation, the church. I just don't really want it to cost me anything. Uh, how many of you guys, this, is, this might be a crazy illustration, but how many of you guys have been watching Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power? Anyone in the room? Well, it, this should land okay. A few of you have seen it. Uh, we me and Danica, we've been watching Rings of Power, which, by the way, most people are watching it. Not to, I'm not the weird one here, but uh, Rings of Power. And there is a character in there, Kella Brimbor. And I, I, me and, I had kind of been sharing some of this with Danica. She's like, don't say his name wrong. It's Kella Brimbor, not Kala Brimbor. I said, don't worry, Danica. They're not going to care. They, they don't care about that. Uh, but there's a character, Kella Brimbor, and he lives in a city, Aragion. And what's happening is uh, he is forging the rings of power. He thinks he's doing a great deed, but he has actually partnered with Sauron, the evil character. And it's not a great deed. It's a deed of evil. It's, these rings are being made to enslave men. And he's making these rings. All the while, Aragion uh, is being destroyed. There's all these orcs and stuff throwing missiles at it, blowing it up to pieces, but there has been a veil placed over his eyes so that when he goes outside, everything looks fine. He's sipping on his coffee, uh, which is where I would be if our city was on fire. He's sipping on his coffee. Things are chill. Uh, the, the town square is happy. Everyone's painting and coloring, and there's 
horses or unicorns or whatever. But in fact, the city is on fire. It's burning to the ground. Uh, there's a moment where he comes to his senses and he realizes that Sauron has placed a veil over his eyes. And there's this moment that really stood out to me, this moment where he says that he kind of knew that none of that was real all along. He says, he enslaved me. It was my fault. From the beginning, part of me knew, part of me saw, but I wanted what he offered. I blinded myself to what he was. And so, I have to ask, what areas of rebuilding in your life or the world around you would you rather not see? What illusions are you happy to live under? There could be more, but I want to point out two specific things we learned from Nehemiah as it pertains to fear. The first one is this, don't fear man. I mentioned it earlier, but Artaxerxes was just a man to Nehemiah. And I was thinking about our fear of man, and there's a verse that I love. It's in Galatians 1.10. It says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. When we are Christ servants, we aren't anyone's servants. As I was preparing, I was thinking, I wish that Nehemiah had this Galatians verse. We see Paul was not afraid of man, not even what men could do to him. He endured physical beatings. He was whipped, beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead in Lystra. And after being stoned and left for dead, he actually marches back into town. In Acts 23, uh, he makes the Pharisees and the Sadducees so mad that it says that they were going to rip him to pieces. And one of my favorite records of Paul is found in Acts 19. Paul causes a riot in his city. And the riot is caused because he posed an economic threat by preaching to the silversmiths who were making idols. The city is thrown into chaos, and it says that Paul actually wanted to go into the theater and face the riot, but his friends had to usher him away. Imagine this huge theater, and Paul's just like, let me at him. I want to go out, and his friends pull him back. Which leads me to the next lesson as it pertains to fear, which is don't cling to safety and comfort. We see, to Nehemiah, God's call was worth losing it all. He was willing to forsake it all for a burden that God had placed on his heart. And I'll admit, for me, as I get older, uh, it's becoming harder and harder to step out of my safety and security. There was a stage in my life where I was willing to risk it all when uh, my bank account was overdrawn, and I was driving a Hyundai Accent with the window cracked, and I was just a single guy. I was like, I don't have much to lose. But now, for me, my prefrontal cortex is formed. Um, <laughs> I have a family, and I feel a tension arising in my life. It can be hard for me to step out of my safe bubble. And I've seen this play out in a few ways. One is just interacting, having conversation, and coming alongside our houseless neighbors. When, when I first felt called into ministry, and my brother-in-laws that are here will remember this, but I was super passionate about serving the Lord on the streets. I, I, I had a dream of being like an urban missionary, a sort of John the Baptist in a San Francisco, a Seattle, or a Portland area. So when my brother-in-law said, hey, what are you going to do? I'm like, I think I'm going to live in a Ford Transit or something. You can imagine they're probably like, hmm, nice plan, nice plan you have here. Um, but uh, as my plan has changed and, and things have happened, um, I've settled in here. Um, God has changed. He's given me a different direction. Life has changed. Something that I once was very passionate about. I had made um, friends in the houses community. I had, God had taught me a ton of things. I had seen a lot of fruit. Um, but now, as I, as I get older, as I have more security, truth is, is that I shy away from it. Fear rises up. What if this individual is unsafe? I have more to lose now. Discomfort rises up. What if they demand more of my time than I'm ready to give? What if I have to, don't have an opportunity to wash my hand after I shake their hand? Don't hear me the wrong way. I'm not saying that we shouldn't use discernment, but in my life, I use the excuse of discernment to stay safe and comfortable. 
There have been times I have felt the prompt of the Spirit and looked or walked the other way. The other time, as recently I can remember being afraid or afraid of losing comfort or for safety was that I almost went on a Guatemala mission trip this summer. Tom remembers because I ditched him. I didn't end up going um, because Nick had left. There were some different things going on around here. But when I thought I was going to go, there was a first excitement and then there was a little bit of fear of I'm, you have to remember, I'm just a small town kid. I have, I, the first time I flew on an airplane was when I was 20 years old. And I started thinking, I'm going to fly somewhere else, and what if, what if I get sick in Guatemala? What if I get kidnapped? I don't know. I'm going to be out of the country. <laughs> um, these are just a couple of the ways in which I've seen comfort and, and fear of losing comfort or safety um, creep into my life. And I could go on. I could, I could share pettier fears like, or, or pettier uh, th- areas in which I don't want to lose comfort, like just in loving and serving my own little family or sharing my downtime with other people. Uh, one, one way in my life is just finances. I grew up in some instability, and so, so stability has come to mean a, lot, mean a lot to me, and maybe at times too much. Um, But I want to extend something from the mouth of Jesus to you and to myself. Luke 9, verses 24 through 25. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? So the truth is, it doesn't matter if we have a four-bedroom, two-bath in the burbs, a financial safety net, or even three months of of food stored up in preparation for a cyber attack, if we forfeit Jesus' calling in our life. Jim Elliott famously said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And I know that I'm talking in, in big things like life or death situations, but we don't even have to go there. A good place to start is just what eternal opportunities are you sidelining because you're so focused on temporary comforts? Is it as simple as lending a helping hand to someone? As scary as standing up for what's right in your community or amongst your peers? Or having that difficult conversation? Is it as risky as a job change? As vulnerable as starting counseling? As hard as rejection from someone you love? This has been a hard sermon to write and a hard sermon to deliver because these steps are difficult. And that's why I believe that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. In chapter 1, Nehemiah has a lengthy prayer, and in this chapter he has an emergency prayer. We see that prayer is his first response, not his last resort. Nehemiah could make bold steps in the public sphere because he had spent time with God in the private place. He was rooted. He was secure. God had given him a burden, a purpose, and security. As I was prepping, I actually just thought we should pray for security and God within our service. And so this doesn't have to be long. Nehemiah's prayer was short. But if you guys would, just bow your heads and maybe place your hands before you. I want to pray a prayer for you. Spirit, I pray that for those in the room who have been reminded of of a calling or something you placed on their heart, or for those who have had something revealed to them this morning, or those who would like to step out, Spirit, I pray that you would minister to them by giving them courage. I pray, God, that that you would help them to cast off fear and comfort, to help them build something of eternal significance. Spirit, would you minister to us this morning? Give us courage and boldness. Amen. This leads me to my next application point, which is boldness. Uh, there was a student recently who, uh, that, I, that I heard about this story in her life. She is in our ministry, and she was, she's in, really into drama and theater, and she had high hopes of being cast in a certain role, as the lead role. And in this role, she would have to say the Lord's, in vain, the Lord's name in vain several times. And so she had already pre-planned to have a conversation with her drama director about this, to say, hey, I'd rather, I, I, it goes against what I believe, I don't want to say this. And I remember when I heard that, I went, wow, that is like super bold and courageous. But what was 
inspiring to me is that she had an even bigger dream, which was to lead her drama uh, teacher to the Lord. She said, I hope I get to, to share the gospel and, to, and maybe even lead her to the Lord. And uh, I just was like, wow, maybe we aren't always thinking big enough, right? Sometimes our conversations go like this. If only I'll get this granted, that would be God showing up. Like, if my boss or my coach or my family member would just blank, uh, that'll be God showing up. But I think this passage invites us to dream even bigger. It's like I've been reading uh, with my three-year-old son, uh, if you give a mouse a cookie, right? If you give a mouse a cookie, he'll ask for a glass of milk. We, as followers of Jesus, need to ask for the glass of milk because God, if God calls you to do something, his hand is upon you. We oftentimes are dreaming too small. We're, we're settling like, man, if me and my spouse, if we could just stop fighting or if we could just make ends meet or if the school would just stop teaching that one thing. But I believe that there is more on offer what if your dream changed from that to what if me and my spouse became best friends and one another's biggest supporters? Or what if I dreamed bigger about my vocation and was able to step into my God-given calling? Or maybe even just witness to those around me in my workplace. What if my workplace was a mission field? What if my kids used their school to reach those who were far from Jesus? When we step out in bold faith like this, we will face opposition. These guys, uh, Sanballat, the, the Heronite, and Tobias, uh, the Ammonite, they are statuses of economic power, and, and they were threatened by the authority that was granted to Nehemiah. And the worship team can go ahead and come up now, but uh, it says that in this passage that when Nehemiah began to act, that they were distressed. Don't be surprised when you seek to reform something and it distresses others. Your decision to reform is uncomfortable for you, maybe, maybe for you physically, emotionally, or financially, but it will also cost others in those ways. And so don't be shocked when they don't like it. When you, when you shake the apple cart, they want to live happily like Kella Brimbor. They want to be left in their dream world. And so um, don't be shocked when they aren't happy about it, when there's opposition. There is a good thing, though, and it's this, that God's work is not dependent on human attitudes. God's work is not dependent on human attitudes. And so, I want to end with the question that I started, which is simply, what truths are you aware of that demand your attention?